what we're going to what we're going to do now is provide brief overview of the highlights, sort of the takeaways from each breakout session, and um, I think we'll begin with Julie Cordua from the Technology Group. All right. So our group uh, chatted a lot. Uh, I think we had a good sharing of ideas and experience um, of, of different um, people who work in different fields and have applied technology in different ways. I think what I'll do is just share some of the frameworks that we were working with. Um, as a takeaway for um, people who want to think about how can they apply technology in their uh, organization or in the field specifically that they, they work in. Um, we talked about kind of five areas where technology can be transformative. Um, really, and I'll get into this in a minute, but really just in the beginning always um, understanding and thinking about your unique situation. Um, not trying to go too big, too quickly, but really focusing on a very unique tech, uh, need with your organization. Um, but investigations, uh, so we uh, it seemed that there was some difference between uh, child sex trafficking, criminal investigations, and data being used for labor trafficking uh, investigations. There hasn't been a lot of, I think, evidence of that being successful and happy to hear if um, people are seeing that happen at scale. But um, technology can rapidly change an investigation uh, structure. So when you have a lot of data, you have to have data, um, and you can use um, data science and analytics and networking to help officers focus on what is most important, you can drastically reduce the time an investigation takes and you can become more intelligent. So uh, one, an example, our tool, Spotlight, reduces investigation time by 60% for child sex trafficking in the United States. Um, and also what we're trying to do is help focus not just on one individual victim, but as Tina mentioned earlier, helping officers look at the bigger picture and the network that is attached to that child so that you're not just taking one person out of a situation, but you um, really quickly, within a minute, can see the entire network instead of having to spend weeks or months with subpoenas and getting data. It's all there at your fingertips. So investigations is an area technology can be transformative. Um, for labor trafficking, uh, we uh, heard a lot about transparency. So things like... Um, mobile money payments all the way down to the end worker. There's an example of an app called Now Money um, where uh, the manufacturers who contract with the workers are required to pay their workers through that app so that the um, top company, and I'm not going to use the right word, but like let's say Nike contracts with the manufacturer. Nike can see that the money they're paying the manufacturer gets all the way to the end worker because the entire financial transaction chain is... Um, is mobile. And also the end worker who may not have a bank account can use mobile banking um, as a way to actually be able to get their money and transfer it home uh, to their home country. So transparency in uh, supply chain has been a, another example. Um, communication and kind of um, data visualization for communications um, and policy was another example. Polaris Project has done a great job of this. They um, lift up and, and show kind of hot spots that they're seeing through their hotline domestically and um, globally. Also providing alternative ways for um, uh, either victims' voices or workers' voices. So again, Polaris Project has used the Be Free Tech short code to give child sex trafficking victims a way to text, even when they might not be able to call. Or on the labor side, um, labor link and labor voices uh, are ways of get gathering. Um, for labor link, it's actually not anonymous. I, th I don't believe labor voices is an anonymous app where the end worker is providing feedback on the working conditions. Um, and that is able to, again, go all the way back up to the company that is contracting with that manufacturer so they get full transparency on what is happening um, on the ground. Uh, the, the fifth area 
um, that was identified was resource sharing. So a few people brought up ideas that um, there have been great apps where when you have a lot of people we know in trafficking, it's a very um, full field. We have a lot of organizations doing a lot of things, a centralized area where people can either share resources or communicate on what's, what's happening so there's not a lot of overlap and we kind of leverage everyone's expertise um, together. Um, another framework we looked at is um, how to think about building a technology solution. I think um, one thing we talked about was really understanding what you're trying to achieve. So not starting with the, the statement, I want to build a system that, don't ever try to build a system. Try to solve a problem. So um, I'm just using an exa our, a personal example of us is, um, I want to find a 13-year-old being sold online just using the escort ads. Put that in front of an engineer, and an engineer will tell you five different ways you can try that. They won't tell you how you can do it. So then that's the, uh, the second part, which is define your problem very concretely and on the human level, and then um, be ready to fail. So don't ever map out an entire technology solution. I heard recently that <laughs> Um, the U.S. government recently signed like a 10-year contract for technology that had a 10-year plan for technology. And I'm like, wow, their future, it can tell the future. Um, don't ever start a hypothesis with the end result in mind yet. Be, build a culture of innovation that you start with the question, you have the ability to iterate, innovate, try, fail, and when you find the success, be ready to scale it. But don't plan scaling it until you've figured out what exactly works. Um, specifically, in our international community, really understand what market you're working in. Um, don't try to take a solution from one country or one field of trafficking and apply it elsewhere. Um, for sex trafficking, for instance, our spotlight tool cannot just be plopped in another country by any means. Um, there are different dynamics to trafficking. There's different um, levers at play, uh, especially in Europe, Southeast Asia to, to uh, Middle East. If you are not operating in a country and you're trying to develop a technology solution in that country, don't. Or partner with an organization that is in that country um, and can offer you that expertise. Um, understand who your end user is. Is it the victim? And, and similar to defining the question, don't identify the organization or a group of people find a person. So is it that officer Fred who's on the front lines? And if he is, he should sit with your engineers while you're building the tool. Is it that victim is, who's going to be texting? If it is, that victim should be a part of the development as well. Is it this NGO? Have someone from the NGO be a part of the development um, as well. Understand exactly down to the person who is going to be using the tool you're building. and. Um, and make sure you understand uh, what data is available. So a lot of times, if you don't have data that can teach uh, the technology you're building, um, then your first job should really be about gathering data um, in order to, to build a solution. Um, and the last thing was uh, just a little bit of what we, uh, or second to last thing, a little bit of what we talked about was just kind of the process of innovation, which I alluded to, is just, um, Make sure you have multiple lines of information coming into your organization when you want to innovate. So hear from uh, survivors, technologists, subject matter experts. Make sure you prototype, test, and fail fast, then productize, then measure, and then do that cycle over again. Um, and the last topic we talked about was just um, how you build this innovation um, outside of government. Um, and how government should possibly get involved in this and at what stage, and I can't say we had an answer, but uh, the belief that we should be able to innovate more in the private sector but have the financial support from government to scale uh, projects at work. Thanks. Maurice. Thank you very much. So we started with two propositions. Uh, this is the International Trafficking Group. The first proposition is that what we've seen over the last 15 years or so is the birth of a social movement for justice. Uh, compared to where we were 15 years ago uh, in the trafficking issue, 
that we have seen a global awakening to slavery and a recognition that there is, in fact, a global problem that needs to be addressed that there's been a very significant policy response, the Palermo Protocol, TVPA. Many countries have laid the legal predicates for action which didn't exist uh, 10 or 15 years ago. That's been accompanied by the development of trafficking as an academic field, not looking at what happened in the 19th century, but looking at modern day slavery in terms of, of research and uh, coursework and centers that have popped up in academic institution. All of this has led to uh, more resources being invested compared to where we were again 10 or 15 years ago. This in turn has spurred the development of some effective approaches against slavery, including the community empowerment approach, which gets at the root causes in the vulnerable communities that are being exploited by traffickers, the supply chain approach, which tries to change the incentive structure for businesses, uh, and the, uh, the approach that's founded on ending impunity, which really tries to heighten the risk and cost to traffickers. So all of these have come together in complementary uh, approaches, and there's been a proliferation of organizations. We noted that in the Global Modern Slavery Directory, there's now something like 3,000 organizations around the world that say they're working against human trafficking. And again, if you compare that to what was the case 10 or 15 years ago, it's really an amazing change that has happened over that time period. So that's the good news. Uh, but this is not yet a mature movement. Uh, the architecture of the movement remains feeble. The mechanisms by which we collaborate collect for, for collective action in the field or for research or as a political coalition, that, that all of that is still pretty weak. Uh, this has, helps explain the reality of resource gaps. While there's, while there's uh, more money, it's still very limited. Uh, a lack of, uh, of good research uh, around this, the weaknesses of institutions, and the fact of the matter is, despite all the good work that's being done, that we have very limited scale and scope of action. And so the challenge to the group with these propositions is, where do we go from here? And the responses from the group really fell into several major themes. One was the importance of spurring collective action. Uh, so there was a recommendation, for example, that governments act to incentivize the creation of what were called freedom ecosystems that would bring together different actors from different sectors with the incentives and pressure from the government to basically encourage that collaboration. There was a proposal to create an international multi-sectoral center of excellence that could serve as a core resource where uh, data and research would be pooled, that would offer opportunities for training and to sponsor conferences. Uh, the creation at the national level of websites where the different actors would be displayed on that website, they would put forward their information on that website and the opportunities that were available to work together. Uh, there was a proposal to, to heighten intergovernmental collaboration around the issue of trafficking as a part of migration flows. And we all recognize we have to distinguish between migration and smuggling and trafficking, but specifically that piece of migration that yields trafficking needs greater intergovernmental collaboration. Uh, there was a proposal for NGO consolidation to make more efficient use of resources and collaboration through the newly formed Alliance 8.7, which is attempting to bring together actors from the different sectors. So a bunch of recommendations around spurring collective action. Uh, a second major theme was around capacity building. And this included areas such as capacity building for prosecution, which we recognize is a weak area universally, uh, and, cap and capacity building for data collection on both victims and, pros and uh, perpetrators. Uh, we did see some new challenges that need attention, trafficking in failed states and trafficking and in armed conflict. Uh, those are new and very challenging phenomena that emerged that we really haven't even begun to address. Uh, we talked about work in some specific sectors, particularly economic incentives for businesses and regulating labor recruitment along with market incentives to mitigate trafficking in labor recruitment. And finally, a, a good conversation about addressing root causes to identify and address both the risk and protective factors that lead people into trafficking. And I want to thank my members of my group who were really just wonderful. Thank you. Anique. So in the labor trafficking group, we walked through two different scenarios and talked about what 
uh, some potential strategies would be for various stakeholders, whether you're part of civil society, whether you're part of government, or whether you're part of the private sector. So our first case study, we looked at the Department of Labor list of goods that are made with child and forced labor. The most recent report came out last September, um, and there were 27 additional line items that were added to that report, so 27 additional goods from particular countries that were added. But there's also one good from one country that was taken off that report this year uh, because of significant improvements that have been made to that supply chain. So we talked through how can we, uh, in our various roles as um, within civil society, private sector, uh, or the U.S. government, what are our various roles and, and strategies together um, so that we can collaboratively work to improve particular supply chains and see maybe a couple more products come off that list next time if we're being really ambitious or maybe a couple reports down the road. Um, so first we talked about uh, civil society's role. We um, talked about the need to create pressure with companies um, to educate them on, on what particular products in particular countries might be most at risk so that they know where what parts of their supply chain are most at risk for, for forced labor. Um, we talked about the need for um, NGOs in particular to understand particular supply chains, to work with companies to understand what the particular, what the different choke points are, um, and to understand different supply chains in different sectors are, um, have different complexity to them. So it, um, and most of us are, maybe I should just speak for myself uh, as a, a longtime trafficking NGO staffer, I'm not really an expert on how uh, the particulars of supply chains and purchasing within companies. So it's important for us to collaborate on that to, to better understand the landscape. Uh, and then we talked about the need to work with the government to survey and understand prevalence within a particular product. It's hard to go after a particular supply chain with limited resources when you don't necessarily know um, where the area with highest concentration is so that you can sort of get the most bang for your buck. Um, and then we talked about also the need to work with government for overall monitoring and to um, be able to see, hopefully, ideally, a uh, reduction over time. Um, a couple other things we talked about with that particular um, case study. We talked about the need for the um, private sector to raise awareness both within its own company but also um, amongst its consumers of um, their supply chains uh, and being more transparent about um, what policies they have in place and um, issues as they arise in their, what they're doing to address issues when they find them in their supply chain. We also uh, talked about the need for industry-wide collaboration. We've seen this in a couple of sectors, garments in particular come to mind, um, where companies are sharing best practices and also sharing as they share many different um, similar points on their supply chain. They're using um, maybe factories, factories in similar countries. They're sourcing similar products from similar places. Um, to share what they're finding and where they're, um, how they're addressing those challenges. And then on the government side, we also talked about the um, need to partner with the private sector on um, when they're identifying challenges in their supply chains in other countries. The U.S. government can then use their diplomatic pressure to work with those countries. Um, we talked about uh, just generally enforcing the law. We talked a, little, a fair bit about the Tariff Act, which um, had, there was a, consumptive demand clause in the Tariff Act for the last 80 years that said you could uh, import goods produced with forced labor if um, our demand uh, exceeded our ability to produce it domestically. And that uh, clause was just repealed about a year ago now. So we have, for the first time in 80 some years, almost 85 years, a real opportunity now to enforce this ban on imports that are coming into the country um, with forced labor. And so are there opportunities, um, one with the government, um, different agencies within the government learning what products coming from what sectors are most at risk. Um, and then also um, down the road, is there opportunity for impact litigation that um, will motivate uh, companies? So, and then the second scenario we talked about was, um, many of you are probably familiar with the Trillium Farms case that um, just handed down several indictments last summer. Uh, this is an egg farm outside of Cleveland, Ohio, where um, they hired a, the company, Trillium Farms, hired a labor recruiter who was um, trafficking children from Guatemala, mostly teenagers, uh, though some younger. And part of the trafficking scheme was that as the minors were coming across the border, they were unaccompanied. And so the, um, unfortunately, the, at the time, the U.S. government was handing over um, the 
unaccompanied minors directly to the traffickers. So how do we, there's a bunch of different choke points in that case, and how do we, um, how do we address that? So we talked about the various intervention points. Um, the, I mentioned the unaccompanied minors, the process for vetting them and vetting the um, sponsors who um, will uh, come to pick them up. Um, we talked about the need for more labor inspectors and um, general regulation, particularly we were talking about the regulations in the agricultural industry around inspections um, and how those might differ from other, uh, other industries. Um, the last thing I'll mention is we talked about the need for um, solutions to both be consumer driven, um, to put pressure on companies, but also for the solutions to come from the top down um, so that companies can influence their suppliers to change their practices. Um, and then the last thing we talked about uh, the need to, um, with prosecutions, particularly on labor trafficking, we use other statutes often to prosecute under besides just trafficking and um, thinking about redefining success uh, with labor trafficking cases in particular, and are there other statutes where we might see more success and um, put more pressure on labor traffickers generally? So, thanks. And last but not least, Stacia. Thank you. I want to thank all the members of the domestic minor sex trafficking uh, breakout. You guys were excellent. Um, your ideas and your contributions were great. You not only posed challenges, but solutions and examples of model programs. So that was really appreciated. Um, and collectively, I'm going to give you the highlights of uh, some of the concepts that we came up with that should be included in any multidisciplinary strategy to combat child sex trafficking here in the United States. Uh, we started out with the topic of foster care um, and the need to provide training and resources to foster care, social workers, group homes. And in order to do that, we need to effectively engage survivors to be part of that process. Obviously, survivors who were part of, the, of their trafficking experience was within the foster care system, but also beyond that um, as well. And that as we are engaging with the foster care system um, and any really approach or strategy, we wanna make sure that uh, it's an extremely thoughtful approach to standards of care, that we have seen some well-intentioned ideas uh, run amok, unfortunately, when they are practically implemented. So a really thoughtful approach to standards of care um, another theme that we talked about as being really crucial to this strategy would be linking systems of care. And obviously, if it's a multidisciplinary strategy, we want to include all those multiple dis disciplines at the table. But what's really important is that it's not the trafficker or it's not the trafficking victim or survivor's role to know how to navigate our complex systems that don't always work that well together. And so linking those systems of care um, and having within those links and those discussions uh, the focus on not criminalizing those victims and survivors so that we are all operating, you know, singing from the same sheet of music per se, um, that while we are providing every available resource to this minor and it's not their job to know how to navigate these systems. Uh, a theme that came up is obviously housing, resources, shelter, all of that is difficult for all teens who are being trafficked in this country, but specifically that age group of 16 to 18 year olds, that they seem to have, they're an identified gap, that they don't fit as well into some of the existing uh, resources and settings that we have, specifically foster care um, and therapeutic foster homes. It just is difficult to try and find those foster homes for that age group. And that we did identify some uh, programs that are employing good recruitment strategies in terms of finding and developing those therapeutic foster homes for those older teens specifically, and making sure that we do everything possible to make sure no age group falls through the uh, cracks, but especially the older 16 to 18 year olds. We talked about the need to develop policy, screening, intervention, and prevention strategies and protocols so that we are not reacting in a crisis response to an individual case as it rises to everyone's knowledge level, that we have those 
policies and procedures already in place so that it's a structure that already exists and so that when that survivor encounters these resources, it's, it doesn't look like we're piecing it together um, with you know, scotch tape. It's something that is already established and they can feel that wraparound services around them. Um, but that also speaks to the ability to have prevention services as well and integrate them into all of these policies and procedures. We talked about two different audiences, or maybe three actually, that need to be part of these strategies, and that includes uh, judges as well as medical professionals and the hotel industry, that there are some existing trainings and resources that are out there from SOAR that we heard about earlier to ECPAT's program related to the travel and hospitality industry. We need to leverage those existing resources to provide training to all of those groups and make sure they're actively part of this uh, discussion and this strategy. And then the last two um, are take this as an opportunity now to take everything we've learned and the fact that there is not enough prevention education and money towards resources to prevention education to take this as a time to advocate as TVPA is up for reauthorization, um, leverage that opportunity to make sure prevention is part of our comprehensive strategy to address domestic minor sex trafficking. And then the last one, we can't talk about uh, addressing child sex trafficking here in the United States without at least talking about we need to have an effective response or at least a response uh, to demand. And that includes reduction strategies, but also a response, whether it's criminal justice or otherwise, to when it does occur. So those were the highlights um, that we had from the domestic minor sex trafficking breakout. And again, I appreciate everyone who contributed. You guys did a great job.